Well, I'd be derelict if I didn't show you some of the results of yesterday's video. This is amazing, isn't it? See, now you can see why I really enjoy this kind of stuff. You can actually hear that. Stay tuned. We're going to talk about uh, PIDs today, and I'll show you a little bit more about these. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You remember yesterday we, we did these three fermenters, um, and you can see that video here. Um, it, the last thing that we did was we put them on the shelf. I placed a fan out and had wind blowing across it just to cool them down. I had to get them below 100 degrees. Uh, then I adjusted the pH, of course. You know, you, you always adjust the pH just prior to putting in the yeast, and that's the last time, okay? Uh, a lot of people get confused. Don't track the pH after that. Leave it alone because it, it, it's going to it, it'll, it'll do its own thing. Uh, but start with a healthy pH of about 5.2. Uh, so I did that, and I added the yeast, and within about 45 minutes, I started getting a bubble here and there. But, you, you know, and, and I do, I always get so excited. i, I got to give you a close-up view of this and show you why I enjoy using these glass fermenters, because you can actually see, see that, all that activity? Um, and that's the kind of stuff I like to watch. Uh, It'll swirl, it's turbulent, uh, it goes absolutely, I call it batshit crazy. Uh, when you put a light in here, so you can really see the activity of those that yeast and the, what it's causing to take place inside that mash. Now that is happening all the way, all throughout, all the way down the bottom, all the way through the top. And you can hear, and if you touch it, you can feel the warmth generated because the, the yeast, the activity of yeast, it's like, look at it this way, it's like a, a bunch of runners uh, in a marathon. Uh, it may be 75 degrees outside and then they all start running, but they all start to build up internal heat because they're working. Same thing with yeast, they're working. So they create a lot of heat um, and that's normal and it's natural. So the, the temperature of your mash will increase on its own, anywhere from five to nine or so degrees uh, and then it'll it'll, It'll drop back off after the yeast are finished, but that's perfectly okay. Uh, it's the same thing with a runner, you know. It, once a runner stops running, then their body starts to cool down. So think of it that way. It's a, that's a good analogy. Uh, let me, welcome back to Barley and Hops. Yep, I'm George. Today, uh, we're going to work on a PID controller. Um, this is the 120-volt PID controller, which is good for up to a 2,000-watt element. That really lends itself perfectly to an eight gallon still. Uh, anything larger than that, you, I would recommend you go to a higher rated element. And if you do that, of course, you're gonna need to go to 240 volts, uh, which is, we've got videos on that as well, how to assemble those. Now, I've got several of these things. Like, see, we, we, here's the model we used when we did the, hey, let's put this on a piece of wood, and make it real simple. Uh, so we showed you how to wire that one. Here's a pulse width modulator. We did the same thing. We mounted that on a piece of board, and that works extremely well. Um, but when you want to sex it up a little bit, you know, you, we put them in a box. This one is a 240-volt model, and you can tell that by the plug, the orientation of the blades on the plug. One of them is horizontal, the other one is vertical. That tells you right off the bat that that's more than likely a 240-volt plug so you're looking for that type of a circuit um, and this one is what I use for 3500 watt element uh, anything larger than that then I use the 30 amp model and the 30 amp model just has a heavier cable and a different receptacle uh, so uh, they're all universal I mean it's they're, they're all wired generally the same way it's just you have to keep in mind whether you're using 240 volts or 120 volts and the items you use to withstand the current, which is the draw of electricity, okay? Now remember, the byproduct of current is heat, and of course we have to dissipate that heat, and I'll show you that as well. On this particular model, this is the 120-volt uh, model, I'll use SJOOW power tool cable. Uh, you can get this at Lowe's, Home Depot, uh, in any of your electronic stores, it's S-J-O-O-W, and this one is 12-2, which is 12-gauge wire, which will works extremely good. It's rated for a 20-amp circuit, 
uh, but it's 12 gauge wire with two conductors and one ground. So they call it 12-2. If it was 12-3, it would have three conductors and one ground. So current carrying conductors, of course, they're all conductors, but they're identified as in 12-2, two current carrying conductors and one ground. So I'll use that and we'll show you how all of that goes together. It's relatively simple. I've pre-made or pre-assembled some of the items on the boxes um, and opposed to putting on a block of wood, uh, you can get these on Amazon. Please just start searching for them. They're project boxes. Uh, this one's like a six by eight, um, I think four inches deep. Um, they come in many different shapes, many sizes, many depths, many lengths, uh, different colors. Uh, so it's whatever really floats your boat. But this is about the minimum size, you know, six by eight. Uh, it, everything tends to, seems to fit in it, for me anyway, uh, relatively easy. I've already added the fan, and that's my internal fan right there with a fan guard. And that I use, of course, with the vent holes. And I use that uh, when I get it plugged in and turned on. When I turn it on, I'm going to wire it so that when I turn it on, the fan automatically comes on. And so this fan creates a current in here, and it dissipates any heat buildup by some of the other, or really the only other electronic device that's going to be mounted in the bottom of that box uh, that could potentially get warm, and that is the solid-state relay. The solid-state relay is really nothing more than a switch that you don't control your PID controls. And that PID controls that, that switch through an optical sensor. Uh, and it does it by providing 12 volts of direct current across these two bottom pins, pins three and four. Uh, and then the switch is between pins one and two. Oh, the benefit of an optical switch is that it is so almost instantaneous uh, and it's controllable. So uh, that's why we use a solid state relay. And this one is a 40DA. That is direct current in to control A, AC current out. Uh, that's the nomenclature for this is a, an SSR 40DA. Uh, you can use an SSR 25DA because that one will handle 25 amps. This one will handle up to 40 amps. Uh, I just happen to have this one that came with my PID. Um, okay, uh, some of the other things that we have in here, of course, I'm going to use a just a regular standard outlet because it's only 120 volts. I'm going to use a standard outlet that's rated for 20 amps, up to 20 amps. Uh, and I know that, just first of all, by by looking at the writing on the side of it, because it's all they're all listed, they're UL listed. But if you'll notice on these, uh, you'll see a slot here, a side slot, and then a vertical, horizontal and a vertical slot on one of the blades. Um, if it has that, it's normally rated at 20 amps. Uh, the ones that are rated at 15 amps normally have only two vertical slots. Uh, and this one also will, will accept uh, if you've got it wired for 125 volts, because they do make a 125 volt plug that has a vertical blade on one side. So, that's just a little bit of history or info. Um, the, the fan itself is a 5 volt direct current fan. We, we've got 120 volts going into the box, but we've got a fan that works off of DC, direct current. What do we do? We convert that. Yeah, what I did was I put a USB plug on the end, and it's a real simple solder job. And then I take a cell phone charger, because incidentally, the cell phone chargers are all 5 volts, direct current. And so this one is a 5 volt direct current fan, and cell phone chargers are designed to be plugged in, and in a lot of cases just left that way. Uh, so they work almost forever. And there's a small integrated circuit that does the work. And you plug this in. And then we will direct wire from here with some blade covers. And we will mount this inside the box so that every time we turn the switch on and turn on the controller, the fan will work automatically by itself. 
it just it's on when the box is on and it's off when the box is off so we've got that to go through uh, and we'll get there very easily I've got a switch 120 volt switch and this one's rated at 20 amps so you know people argue with me about that all the time just read it it's on the side of the switch um, so uh, this one happens to be a lighted switch okay and what happens is is when you on of course it allows current to flow through from these two bottom posts so hot in hot out it just all it is is a switch that connects these two the top one is the neutral and you need a neutral on this only to make the light come on so if, if you don't connect the top blade to the neutral then when you'll turn it on it'll work it just won't light up so it's a lighted switch we've got to place that inside our cover which I've already added the PID controller right there this is the Inkbird 106 VH model ITC 106 VH uh, they make a bunch of different models just go on the internet and look them up um, and you'll see all the different versions that are available and on the bottom here, I put this, this is something that's not absolutely necessary, just kind of neat to have because it gives you something to look at. Uh, it's a volt amp meter. And this one here, this one is pretty interesting because it gives you the overall um, power consumption and then power consumption over time. So it's really, it's really neat. It's a bunch of integrated circuits in here and it just runs off of two wires off the back. And it's going to run off of, I'll find it, what I call the donut, which is nothing more than a... A current sensor we'll show you how that works now on the side of the PID controller itself you'll notice it has this wiring diagram and you'll notice on here there's pin 6 and pin number 8 now pin 6 and pin number 8 operate and it's written right next to those two pins operate you see that SSR that's what operates this uh, yes. So you take a wire from pin number six, which is the negative post, and pin number eight, which is the positive post, and you run a wire to pin number four, which is the negative post, and pin number three, which is the positive post, and that makes the solid state relay work. And every time that the PID tells the solid state relay to operate, this red light will come on. So you'll be able to you'll be able to see it. Uh, whether you have something connected to it or not, you'll be able to see uh, it's being operated by your PID. The other two pins that we are going to be at, well, really, there's four more. Um, we have pins 9 and 10. 9 and 10 are your power. That's the power into the controller. And it doesn't matter, hot on 9, neutral on 10, or hot on 10, neutral on 9. It doesn't matter. I, either way, it'll, it's, it's going to work. Uh, just that's just the way 120 volts works okay and in this particular case and then the last two wires that we have our concern ourselves with is pins since we're going to use a K type thermocouple the probe that senses the temperature you see we've got to give it some method it's got to be able to feel uh, in order to operate so on pins number three and four and you'll notice it's written right down there pins three and four uh, that's what you wire the connector thermal probe to and those are all also polarity specific and it'll tell you that pin number three is the negative and pin number four is the positive okay now on, on most k type thermal probes you have a red and a blue or a red and a black the red is the positive the blue or black is the negative now what happens if you hook them up backwards well then your pid reads temperature backwards meaning as your probe gets hotter the numbers go are going down on the front of your controller. That's all. So if that ever happens to you, you'll know, oh, got, got it wired backwards. You just rewired. You're not going to hurt it. Uh, the third connection on there, a lot of people get this confused. That third connection, pin number five, is only there if you're using a three-wire uh, thermal probe, which is a PT100. There are a few others out there, but normally the, the K-type thermal probe is a really, really sensitive and you know, almost a universal probe that almost everybody uses. Uh, you can use the PT100. There's probably six or seven other ones that you can program uh, by going through the parameters. Please read the instructions. They're simple. Almost. 
But we got a video on that too. Okay. Um, now, last but not least, what else have I got here? Um, yeah. Oh, geez, that, that's about it. Oh, what I have to do is I've got to find a place to put my switch. And what I did is I cut out a, uh, a, a form that my switch just fits in, just like that. And what I'll do is I'm going to trace that somewhere in this neighborhood right there. And then I'll take you over to the Dremel tools and we'll cut that out. How's that? Yeah, now I've got these uh, Dremel tools all mounted here with different switches so I can, I can operate each, each one. I've got one foot pedal which makes it really, really useful. So I'm going to use the first one, which is just a small circular saw. Um, and I'll show you a close-up of that because all I want to do is I want to pull out enough material so that I can use the one I have on the far right end, which is a another piece, an attachment like a big fat drill bit on the end of a Dremel tool that'll just eat out all that material. So we'll show you that. And that's pretty much all that is. Uh, that's just a rough cut. And what I'll do now is use, where did I put it? Yep. Yeah, just use a, a razor. And what I'll do is I'll square off those edges until uh, I can get that switch to just slide in there. Then I'll use glue on the back end, hot glue or super glue, just to hold it in place. We'll be back. It's time to assemble the uh, the base, and that's this is relatively straightforward. I use these number eight uh, Phillips head screws that are beveled. So um, I put one in there, and then I just insert because it slides right in there into that where that screw is. And I use, of course, self-locking nuts. Uh, whereas if you don't have self-locking nuts with that, you know, that nylon that's in there, now if you don't have those, uh, I'd recommend putting lock washers on here so that way they doesn't come, they doesn't, there, there is no potential for it to come loose. So let me get this, uh, tightened in real good. There, now we have one heat sink. Yeah, that's what that is. That's a heat sink. And that goes right in front of these vents. And of course, the, your fan just draws the air right across that. Uh, so it really works well. This is the thermal grease I was talking about. Uh, this is HY400. Uh, you can get them in small tubes. Uh, any, just go to your electrical shop. Um, it's relatively inexpensive. And it only takes a little bit because all you want to have is a little bit of grease to make that to make that connection. See, and all you do is just smear that on there. Just a real thin. The the least the better. Uh, the more the more challenges because it'll be it won't lie flat. And then I always place my. Now I place this, this is the solid state relay, and I place this oriented towards where the cable's coming in. So I'll place it that way so my number one and my number two pin will be on this end. Ah, there we go. 
one solid state relay assembled or mounted in the base. Um, so what I have left now is the fan. The fan and of course the cable that goes in. Uh, so the fan, what I've already done, you see I take those spade, those protected spade connectors and put them on the blades and then of course I just squeeze it on real tight. Uh, and this will be mounted in the base of the box with a hot glue gun adjacent to the solid state relay. I'm just going to put that right there uh, so it's out of the way. Now I can, I can orient it in any direction I want. All right, it's time now to add the cable. Now you'll probably, as we go through this, you'll probably go, oh yeah, man, you know, there's another way that, there is, there's about six or eight, maybe 12 or 15 different ways to wire this. It's just the most direct method that I find is uh, the most useful. Uh, so you may decide to wire it another way. Uh, I usually have like about eight or 10 inches of this cable left over on the inside because it's easier to have the, excess and cut some of that off on the inside once you get this gland plug uh, screwed on all the way so that the cable doesn't go anywhere. Uh, it's a lot easier to cut off a little excess than it is to try to add some to it. So uh, in that way I also have the one ground is a continuous ground uh, all the way to the receptacle because I don't need that ground anywhere else in the box. Um, it's just not necessary. But what I do need from this point, and see I've got enough of my neutral line to go anywhere I want to in the box, and of course I've got some additional uh, hot. When I cut that off, I'll have another piece that I can run from. You'll see what I'm talking about, because this becomes so easy at this point. All right, so now that is it, as a matter of fact. That is the, the base of this box of uh, this controller already assembled together. All we got to do now is just match this to the tell you know, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Okay, now this is what my PID controller is going to look like. Of course, it's on and off PID, volt amp meter, and this is my receptacle. And I've already got this pre-cut and pre-drilled and ready to go. So what I want to have happen in this particular case, and it's totally up to you, I want the top a portion of this receptacle to be controlled by the PID. But I want the bottom of the receptacle to be available to me anytime I want it. So I don't want the PID to control the bottom, I just only want it to control the top. And we can do that, it's called, it's called splitting the... I'll show you that. It's, it, we, we're going to split this receptacle into two receptacles. Because right now it's universal, it's one full receptacle with two entry points or exit points. Uh, and we're just going to remove one, we're just going to separate those so that we can operate them independently of each other. And to do that, you'll notice on the side you have brass screws on this side, that's the hot, and you have the silver screws on this side, and that's the neutral. Well, if we break this tab that connects this screw to this screw, then what that does is it isolates the top from the bottom. So it means that we'd have to have a hot wire to operate the top receptacle, and we need another hot wire to operate the bottom receptacle because they're not connected. We leave the neutral side connected because in either case, the top and the bottom, we still need a neutral. So we would just leave that one there, but we're going to grab that tab and twist. And there, there's the small piece, and that separates and isolates this receptacle from top to bottom. Now you've got to decide. Yeah, well, not really decide, but you just got to keep track of where stuff goes because we're going to have, of course, a hot wire going here to this screw to operate this top one. We're also going to need another hot wire on the bottom, and that's going to come from the main power lug. So the first thing we're going to do is we, we, need, we know that we need one that goes to the pin number one. That's the black wire. We're going to need one from pin number one. We're going to need one of those to also go to the bottom of this switch because we want that to be hot all the time. And we also need a small wire. We'll use that from the switch to the PID to operate the PID. 
And then we're going to need another black wire from pin number two to go to the top. You'll see that when we wire it because it makes just so much perfect sense. This is like having two separate receptacles, but we've only got one. Well, I thought I'd give you a, a just a good overhead view to kind of see what's going on because this is where it gets, it, it's not tricky, it's really personal preference. Now this is the donut, I call it a donut, but it's the sensor that goes around the outside of the conductor, of a conductor, and what it does is it senses the magnetic field when current is running through it because that magnetic field expands and contracts it, and based on how much it does that, this sensor picks it up and sends it to the volt amp meter and it'll tell you what the amperage is. Now, we've got one of two options here um, and it's totally up to you. And remember, this only goes around one, one conductor. It doesn't matter if you're running it through uh, 240 volts or 120 volts. If you run it through two, then they'll cancel each other out. Well, if you run it through a hot and a negative. Uh, so you just run it through one of your hot, but we have two here. Now remember, we're gonna have two things that are going on here. We're gonna have power coming in and going into the solid state relay and then coming out of the solid state relay when we want it to via this wire. So when do we wanna measure the amperage? It all depends. If I wanna measure it only when the PID is operating, I'd put it around this one because I'd only want to measure what the PID is actually doing uh, and not anything else that I have attached to it. But my interest is always what is the total current flowing through my box, through my entire controller. So I put it on the main line that's coming in and that way it will measure anything and everything inside my controller and also changes whenever, because it's got to go through here, any changes that take place with the PID will also be measured because it's coming from the source. So it's totally up to you. You can place it on this one or you can put it on this one. Remember, if you put it on this one, it's only going to register and read a, a, an amperage when your PID is functioning. So whenever your PID shuts off, it'll drop to zero. Uh, in this particular case, uh, regardless of what happens, you should almost always have a reading because you will be drawing some amperage. So that's as simple as that gets. It's Again, it's one of those, it's totally up to you. You don't have to, but you can put it on either wire. Just understand what it's going to be measuring and when it's going to be measuring it. So there. That's connected. Now the next step is to remember this one goes to the PI to whatever your element. That's you're going to operate your element with this one. So that's going to go into the top of your switch, or your receptacle, uh, not the bottom. The bottom is going to be hot constantly because I've just jumped from the hot on this wire. So that one will go in here. So the first one I'm going to attach is the top one. And I've already, there, slide that wire in that hole and screw down that connector. There. So now every time my PID tells my solid state relay to fire and to connect, it will run voltage and current through this wire into the top, which is where I will have my element plugged into. But you'll notice that if you plug anything into the bottom, since it's not connected across here, nothing will happen down here. And that's the way I want it. I wanted the bottom one available to me so that I could use it for a water pump, a radio, a fan, whatever you, I mean, it it's becomes an accessory, which is really neat to have. So this one will go into the bottom one which will be constantly hot. As soon as I plug the system in, this will become like an extension cord. Yeah, as long as I get that 
it's got a small plate in there that gets sometimes gets off balance. There. <laughs> there. Once I get that in there, what does this become? This becomes a power source for the remainder controller. So we're using 12 gauge wire all the way through, all the way up to this point. Now from here out, since it is very low amperage, same voltage but very low amperage, I can use smaller gauge wire like 18 or 20 gauge wire because I'm not drawing that many amps. Let me skin this back a little bit. There. Now I have a power line that I can take from here because this will be constantly hot. Guess where that one's going? Yes, to the switch. All right, I've got that wired. Now you can now you can see it clearly where I've got the hot wire that comes in goes to pin number 1. I'm jumping from pin number 1 on the same black wire that goes into the bottom of my switch which makes this side is going to make this side hot as soon as I plug it in. But my Wire from pin number two, which from the solid state relay acting like a switch, goes to the top of the receptacle. So this receptacle is not going to work at the top unless this is turned on. Now, on the other side, all I did was attach the white wire, which is the neutral, and these are connected still, remember? So we left those connected so that they operate the top and the bottom for the neutral side. I added one more wire from that bottom screw that's my neutral line. The black one is from this bottom screw. That's my hot line. So now I have a hot and a neutral. Everything up to this point has been wired with 12 gauge wire because of the amperage, uh, the potential amperage that you have to draw through it. So it needs to, needs to be safe and it needs to be able to handle it. But from this point forward, we have very low current we still have 120 volts, but we have very low current, so we can get away with smaller gauge wire. And so that's what I've got. I've got those laying out. So there's my hot and my neutral for the rest of my system. And this is the hot and the neutral for the transformer cell phone charger for the fan. Now this will go inside here. and lay right on top, okay? Now, let's wire the top. Now, I've taken the liberty of already bolting in the receptacle, because at this point, it's kind of helpful to have it, it, just lay it out for yourself in front. Now, and this may look like a hot wired mess, but if you just follow this logically, uh, this is where it really makes sense. So let's follow this. Uh, this is the hot wire that comes into the box from here. It comes into the box, that's the hot. It goes to pin number one on the solid state relay. From there, you take a jumper wire from that same connection, and that goes, in this particular case, it looks like the top, but once you rotate it over, it's actually the bottom. So that's gonna operate this portion of the receptacle. Then we run then we run a second wire from pin number two, which will only be hot when the solid state relay is working, to the other portion of the receptacle, which is the top side. Now from there, you see now we're just following the electricity. So once plugged in, this bottom one will always, or this one will always be hot, which will be the bottom side of the receptacle. So since that's the case, we also follow it from here. We run a small wire from the same screw 
since we know this is hot, here it is. If we place that on that blade of the switch, now we have power that comes in, goes to this receptacle, comes from this receptacle, and goes to that switch. Our power to our unit is complete. See, so now we have power all the way to this point. And it won't come out of this other pin until the switch is turned on, which connects these two pins, these two blades together. So let's do that. Okay, I want you to see what I've done here. I've taken the hot wire from the volt amp meter. I've taken the hot wire from my transformer. And I've taken an additional pigtail wire, and I've put them all together on one connector. Now that connector goes to the out pin, which is the one directly next to the hot end pin. So, now this is my hot wire. Now, again, if we follow this logically, it's relatively simple. We've got power that goes in, power that is transmitted here, from here, to the bottom of this switch, and stops. Now when the switch is turned on, it goes to this pin, and it comes out here, and it goes to the volt amp meter, and it also goes to the transformer for the fan. So this one goes to pin number 10. And I can cut that back. We, I've got a lot of excess wire in here, only because it makes it easier to show you how this is wired. So now, theoretically, when the power switch is turned on, I'll have power going to all of my components. What do I have left? I've got the neutral. So follow the neutral logically from where it starts, which is back here on the white wire, and it goes to the red wire. So it's got to go from here, it's got to go to here, and it's got to connect this red wire and this red wire together. So we can do the same thing. We can put all of these together, but this will require me to have four wires in one spade, which doesn't fit. So what I'll do is I'll do two wires with a jumper. And that's why I'll connect them here. You see, they'll be connected together there. Now, there we go. See, there's our pigtail again. Uh, well, I call it a pigtail. This is one additional wire, but you've got these, all these three together, and they go on to this blade. Now, what does that blade do? That, well, that blade makes the neutral connection for all of my components, plus it allows the switch to turn on, the light inside the switch to turn on. So I've got one left over, and... I'm going to do the same thing and kind of trim that back so we don't have a whole bunch of extra wire. I've got that one, and I also have the one from my volt amp meter. And if I put those two together on either side of the same screw, then I have, again, a complete circuit, which will make all my components work my fan work, there. Now the only thing left to do is to connect the solid state relay and the amp meter sensor. Now the connections for the amp meter sensor are not polarity specific, so it doesn't matter which one goes on which lug. Just give them a little tug, yet make sure that they're connected. And then my last two wires, which are my positive and negative, and this is polarity specific, the positive and negative for 
the solid state relay. And now in this particular case, I've gone back to the direct current DC convention, which is red is hot and black is negative. Whereas in AC, black is normally hot and white is negative or neutral. So, pin six goes to, and I'll just double check, pin six is negative and it goes to pin number four on the solid state relay. Pin eight goes to pin number three on the solid state relay. And that is a complete wiring, the complete wiring of a PID with a volt amp meter and a switch. Now there are, there is probably 10, like I said, there's a bunch of different ways that you can wire this, meaning you can have different connections in different places and jumpers and things like that. But to me, this is the most direct method of wiring this so that when I plug it in, now that I turn this over, when I plug it in, this receptacle will be hot so I could plug a light into that and the light would come on. But if I plug it into this one, nothing will happen unless I have the power turned on and the PID operating. That's the only way this one will work. Let's finish the job. One complete PID controller with a volt amp meter and we did get the plug added to the end of it. So now it's our maiden voyage. So what do we do? We plug it in. And then we tested to make sure we got it working right. Well, now it's plugged in so far. What do we know? We know that this one should be hot. So if we plug a light into it, the light comes on and that works. But if we plug it in the top, the light should not come on, which is what we expected. So let's turn our system on. See, I can, I can hear the fan running. I've got 124 volts and Based on the way the PID is already set, um, yep, it's already, it's, it's less than its set value. The perceived value is 21 Celsius and the set value is 50. So that means it, and it's on. It's supposed to be on. That's how it works. That's simple, my friends. Start to finish. I know it's been long, but yes, there's more than one way to wire it. That's just the way I do it. Happy distilling.